Hi, it's Penny here and I'm very late but I'm here to do my January reading wrap up. As usual I'm going to do this book battle style which means I pair up all the books, I battle them against each other and at the end we come up with the champion of the month. Now I did read 13 books during January so we need to just keep going but I will also leave some timestamps down in the description if you want to jump to particular sections. So our first battle is going to be between The Daylight War by Peter V. Brett and Full Moon by Jim Butcher. So both of these are part of a series so I'm working towards my goal of getting through series. That's good. But the first of these two books is The Daylight War. This is book four? Three? I think I'm only up to book three. So book three of the demon cycle. This is set in a world where when the sun goes down demons come out. There's different kinds of demons. Wood demons, fire demons, rock demons, wind demons, mind demons, all sorts of demons. And the people of this land have different wards, magical wards, that they can use to protect themselves against the demons. And throughout their books they're also learning how to use these wards to fight like proactively against the demons rather than just be on the defensive. I really like the concept of this and there are some really cool elements throughout the story but I still think the way that these books are constructed is very strange. Uh, it's told from multiple perspectives but he spends so long on certain perspectives that you almost forget that it's a multiple perspective story. This particular one as well had a lot of women being jealous of other women and just some weird sex stuff that I really wasn't on board with. There were also a few parts from the demon's perspective and also some of the ways that people are using the remains of the demons in really cool ways that I wish it would focus more on. It seems to me like he's done a lot of world building for himself but he's not really sharing it with the audience and as well like we don't really get to follow along with the characters as they learn to use their different magical powers. It's more just that they suddenly know things and I don't know I just that's not the part of the story I'm interested in so it does frustrate me a little bit. I do think that the concepts are keeping me interested enough that I will continue this series but I am going to be continuing it for sure on audiobook because it's easier to get through that way. And you never know like the next two books could surprise me. I do think his writing has been improving for the first three books so there's a chance. Now Full Moon is probably an example of one where the first book in the series I didn't really like. I had a lot of problems with it but it's a very popular long-running series so I thought it's going to improve. I'll give at least the next book a go and I did like the second book better. I still think that there's a lot of problems with the way that the women in the story are described. They're all very generic. They're all potential love interests. They're all beautiful in their own ways and to me they like never really feel like real people. They just feel like potential love interests. But putting all that aside, this series, each book is some kind of murder mystery. We're following this guy named Harry Dresden who is a wizard. So he's using his magical abilities to help solve these magical crimes. In this particular book, the crimes were all based around werewolves. I liked the way that it explored werewolf mythology. I did also just think the murder mystery was more interesting. There was a lot more action. Uh, and I did go into this accepting that there was going to be a lot of weirdness with the way the women were described and so I just tolerated that. I think knowing that it was going to be there made it a lot easier. However when it comes to battling these two books against each other I definitely think Full Moon was much better written. I think both of them have problems with the way women are incorporated into the story and I just think even though it had its problems Full Moon was much better written and I definitely see a lot more potential in that series. So I'm going to put Full Moon through to the next round. Now our next battle is a sci-fi battle. We've got the original by Brandon Sanderson and Mary Robinette Cowell up against Replica by Lauren Oliver. So firstly the original is a shorter story novella by Brandon Sanderson. It was an idea that he had and he got Mary Robinette Cowell in to help him write it because he never has enough time to write all his ideas. And we're following this woman who is a clone and she has been created because her original committed a crime and she's now been given four days to find her original, track them down and bring them to justice and if she does that she'll be allowed to keep living. And so we're following along with her as she tries to figure out why her original would have committed this crime that she doesn't really think is something she would have done. It's also set in this really interesting world where they have theming so you're able to 
set settings with the nanobots in your brain and in your body and they will change the way that you appear to other people but also change the way that you observe the world. This woman has always lived in this world and had all her theming on but as a temporary clone all her theming is turned off and so she's getting to discover what the world is really like without all of this theming and I actually think the theming parts of the story were even more interesting than the cloning part of things and the murder mystery. So I expected to love this and I did really like it. I think I would love to get more in this world but still the short story did wrap things up pretty well. The only thing I was frustrated about is this has only been released as an audiobook I believe and the audiobook has all sorts of music and sound effects built into it and I personally really hate background music when I'm trying to listen to people talk. It's, I find it very distracting in YouTube videos and in audiobooks. And so uh, anytime there would start to be like action or intense things happening, it would start having this music underneath. And I'm sure that a lot of people would really love the way that it built the atmosphere. But personally, I found it really annoying. So I do hope at some point that they will release this in written physical form. But I don't actually know what the plan is with that. Now the other book that I read is Replica by Lauren Oliver. Where is it? Oh it's in my other unhaul pile which is gonna give you a clue how I felt about this. Um, it's a strange book so it's written in this format where half the book is one character's side and the other side of the book is the other character's side so you can like flip it over to read from the other side and you can decide whether you want to read Lyra's story first or whether you want to read Gemma's story first or whether you want to alternate between them. I alternated between them because I thought that I liked that experience of switching back and seeing how the perspectives interweave with each other because that was something I was frustrated with the Daylight War not doing. So I read them back and forth and I think that was a fine way to read it. I don't know what the experience of reading it the other way is like and that's kind of frustrating because I feel like this is a book where it would be fun to read it different ways and just compare the experience but also once you've read a book once the second read is never going to be the same experience anyway annoying. So in this story we've got Lyra who is in this research facility with a bunch of other girls. It seems like they're all clones and they're getting some kind of research done on them but they also have all these medical problems. We're also following Gemma who is discovering that her father has something weird going on and she decides to go to this research facility to try and find out about it. In a lot of ways this is a YA dystopian and it was fine. Like I think someone who was wanting to read a YA dystopian would probably find this fine. I personally was looking for a cool sci-fi with clones in it and so I was kind of disappointed with all the plot holes. Um, a lot of things to me didn't really make sense. It seemed like the author kind of had this idea of where they wanted the characters to go and so they made the characters do the things to get them there without really giving the characters the right motivations. There was something that happened kind of near the end that I thought was gonna like turn everything on its head and really make me uh, love the story but mm, it, after that it kind of dropped off and the ending I felt was pretty unsatisfactory but if you just like your characters to kiss at the end and yay everything's happily ever after even though it's not really wrapped up then maybe it's fine for you but not for me. So I feel like this battle is very uneven uh, and it's probably pretty obvious that I'm going to put the original through to the next round. Then for our next battle we have a couple of YA fantasies both from the same series. So that is Ruin and Rising up against Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. So Ruin and Rising is the last book from the Grishaverse trilogy. This is a story all about this girl named Alina who discovers that she has these Grisha powers. And it's a lot of different Grisha with different powers but her powers are particularly rare and they mean that she's kind of being brought up against this character called the Darkling who is is somewhat of an immortal being who is in some parts of the series debatably good or bad. Anyway this third book did have some good twists but overall just the focus of the story was not what I wanted. I do think for sure Ruin and Rising was better than Siege and Storm the second book. So I think if you've read Siege and Storm and you didn't enjoy it but you kind of want to continue the series you may as well. Also for me the reason why I was reading the Grishaverse is because I had heard so many good things about the Six of Crows duology. So I always kind of suspected I wouldn't be in love with the Grishaverse but I wanted to read it just to give me that 
like background material and I do think that was worth it because there were parts later in the Six of Crows duology where knowing those characters from the Grishaverse was beneficial and just knowing a bit more of the world was beneficial but then going into Six of Crows I do think Six of Crows was significantly better. In Six of Crows we're following this group that's been brought together to pull off this heist so a bunch of like underground criminals although they're also still teens because it's a YA fantasy so of course they are and I will say actually Six of Crows I wasn't really into it until it started giving us the backstories of some of these characters so in my mind the backstories were a million times more interesting than the actual heist and a lot of the characters were going into this heist with not really very interesting motivations as well we kind of have a few different couples in fact pretty much everybody gets paired off which is one thing that I never really like but regardless the main couple is kind of Kaz and Inej and I found them generally pretty uninteresting. They kind of made out to be these amazing criminals but were they? Did I care? Not really. Um, the heist had all this tricksiness to it and I felt a lot of it was pretty unbelievable or didn't really make sense but I'm also admitting that it's very hard to write a good heist so I thought I thought it was fine for what it was trying to do. The main character that I did really like is Nina. Some interesting things happened at the end of the book with her and I really thought that escalated what Lee Bardugo was doing with these Grisha powers. And so I did go into the next book Crooked Kingdom in February so you won't get to find out about it for now but I did go into it feeling a lot more optimistic than I did during the Grishaverse. So again I think it's pretty obvious for this battle I'm going to put Six of Crows through to the next round. Then our next battle is two books from the same series. I tell you in January I was really pushing to do a good job at making progress on series. So I read Hunters of the Dusk and the Vampire Prince both by Darren Shan and they are the fifth and sixth books of the Cirque du Freak series. I've just made those numbers up they're not true. I could look and find out the real numbers. Editing me might do that but I'm probably not going to do it right now because I can't be bothered. Also I'm all trying to think right now because it's been a couple of weeks since I read them like which one was which? What happened? I think the problem <laughs> with this series is that I do really like it it's a lot of fun but each of the books is really short and so I feel like for the rest of the series I'm going to just try and binge them all at once and blend them into one. So in my mind each book does kind of blend into the next one and is part of the bigger story. So basically in the series we have this boy named Darren Chan who's become involved with these vampires. Uh, in The Vampire Prince he has gotten involved with Vampire Royalty and Hunters of the Dusk must be the one before that because I think it's building up to what happens. So at this part of the series the vampires are basically having this war with the Vampanees who are these basically other kinds of vampires who are much more dangerous and not as nice to humans. Not that they're like super friendly with humans but you know the Vampanees like to properly kill people and the normal vampires don't really care about killing people. I mean these books are middle grade so they're not particularly realistic but I just find them a lot of fun and I can definitely see why a lot of people who read these when they were middle grade really love the series and I am interested to see where the series will go as a whole. So hopefully in the remainder of February I can find some time to like binge the final books in the series. As far as picking which one of these is going to go through to the next round honestly it could go either way but I think when I I'm trying to remember I remember Hunters of the Dusk slightly more so I'm gonna put Hunters of the Dusk through to the next round but honestly it could be either one. Then in our last battle for round one we have The Knee Bone Boy by Alan Potter up against Christie's Big Day by Gail Galligan. So The Knee Bone Boy this is a book that I picked up a while ago from a little free library knowing nothing about it I just picked it up because I kind of like the cover and reading the synopsis it seemed like it might be similar to a series of unfortunate events and it was fairly similar in style to a series of unfortunate events um, probably not as epic it's just a standalone rather than being a big series so there weren't as many mysteries going on and you know it's it's one book so it didn't really have that time to set up the same running gags that a series of unfortunate events has and it maybe wasn't quite as dark as a series of unfortunate events but a little bit. So we're basically following these three children who are all kind of different and strange and their mother went missing and there's a rumor that the oldest child killed her which 
as far as we know reading the book is not true and their father is often traveling because he is a portrait artist for ex-royals so people who used to be royal and he will do their portraits so there's a lot of different parts in the story about these different royals and how they lost their throne um, which I found quite interesting. I did really like the fun writing style. The only thing I would say is at the end when it did the final reveal of what had been happening it said as you may have guessed and then the reveal and I honestly had a hundred percent not guessed and given that this is like a middle grade not really a fantasy like there's some fantastical elements but it's this it's not actually fantasy. It's written in a fantastical way but there's not really any fantasy. It's just a strange story that would never happen in real life but nothing that happens is actually fantastical. Does that make sense? Anyway, I did not see the reveal coming and so I don't know like would a middle grade person have guessed? Would they? Anyway, I want to recommend this to people who liked a series of unfortunate events but I'm also slightly hesitant to do so because I wouldn't say it's quite as good and I don't want people to be disappointed. I'm also not 100% like confident in the mental health representation I think some people might not enjoy that so like I'm hesitant to recommend it but I did really enjoy it so take from that what you will. The other book in this battle is Christie's Big Day so this is the sixth book in the Babysitter's Club graphic novel adaptions so the Babysitter's Club books was one of my most favorite series when I was a kid and recently they've been adapting these to graphic versions and I've been reading through them and really enjoying the nostalgia. This one was exactly the same it did a really good job of modernizing the story because these books were originally written in the 80s. Things have changed a lot since then in fact I'm just thinking about the fact that it's been nearly 40 years. So a lot of things have changed they have to incorporate like mobile phones and the internet and all those things that didn't exist back then but I still think they do a really good job of like adapting them to modern times but still keeping the themes and the story the same. So this one is all about Christy whose parents are divorced and now her mother is getting remarried and she's a part of this new wedding which they have to put together in a rush because of certain reasons and as well the babysitters club is helping to look after all the children that have come into town to attend the wedding. So I just really liked it. I thought it was cute. It was a lot of nostalgia and honestly for round one this is the hardest battle for me to make a decision about because I have so much nostalgia for Christie's Big Day but also in a lot of ways it's a very simple story. The writing was fine, the pictures were fine, some pictures were really pretty but I do think the Nemo and Boy was a lot more clever and just much more interesting in the way it was written. So I guess that sounds like I'm gonna put the Nemo and Boy through to the next round and I guess since it sounds like that that's what I'll do. Okay so moving on to round two. For our first battle we have got Full Moon by Jim Butcher. Up against The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. So The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is V.E. Schwab's very hyped new novel. It's about this woman named Addie LaRue who makes a deal with the devil which means that she will live forever but as a consequence no one will remember her and she's unable to leave a mark on the world so she can't even write her name, she can't say her name. And and we're following her both back in 1400s, 1600s, I've forgotten, 1700s. We're following her back as she first makes this deal with the devil and the events leading up to it as well as 300 years later in modern times when she's kind of got the hang of living in this way but then she runs into this boy who actually remembers her and we also get perspective characters from this boy and learn a bit about him. Now this is really well written. I really did think the writing was beautiful. There were some amazing lines that have really stuck with me. However I would also say that I think the people who are going to like this story the most are people who can relate to the key feelings that our two main characters have. So Addie LaRue when she makes the deal with the devil feels a lot like she doesn't have enough time to do everything that she wants to do and that's what leads her to making the deal that she does. But I was also incredibly frustrated with her because despite saying that she felt like she didn't have enough time to do anything she also didn't really seem to do much with her time both leading up to when she made the deal with the devil and then in the 300 years following that she seemed to spend a lot of time just going back to the same places over and over and we don't get to see a lot of what she does during that time because it's 300 years you can't 
include all of that but I felt like any of the interesting parts where she's learning about how to deal with the curse upon her it just kind of skipped over those and I, I understand because the story isn't really about that it's more about this feeling of not having enough time but personally I was very frustrated that she didn't really seem to do much with her time in the 300 years she only seemed to go to a few different countries so many amazing things out there in the world I don't understand why there wasn't so much more included in the story but again the story wasn't really about that it was about the feeling but if you know me uh, feelings are not enough for me in a story and so um, I did find it a little bit frustrating but the amazing writing did make up for it. Also the same with Henry so Henry feels like he isn't enough for other people he really wants to be good enough to feel loved. Uh, I think a lot of people would find that really relatable as well. Again I I don't really although I can definitely relate to feeling like that I've definitely felt like that at times so it wasn't completely unrelatable and same with Addie LaRue like I always feel like I don't have enough time but I'm trying to use the time I do have in the best way that I can whereas I don't feel like Addie LaRue was really doing that necessarily anyway really beautiful book some amazing lines some really interesting themes explored in interesting ways but this whole idea of her living forever and never being remembered that key concept I didn't feel like it was explored as well as it could have been so then that left me feeling somewhat conflicted about the book because that was the concept that I picked the book up for if you know what I mean. Still if we're putting this book up against Full Moon I would definitely say Eddie LaRue is much more beautiful, much more better written, much more well constructed. It's probably didn't have the pacing and the action that Full Moon had and so I don't think Addie LaRue is going to be for everyone but I did really enjoy it. I know I just said a bunch of negative things but I did enjoy it. I gave it four stars. I just think that I would have liked it to have a few different things in it and I think that people who like faster paced books might be somewhat frustrated with it. But regardless I'm going to put The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue through to the next round. Then the next battle is the original by Brandon Sanderson and Mary Robinette Cowell up against Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. So I already talked about both of these books and I think from that you can tell that I enjoyed the original a lot more. I just thought it had some much more interesting concepts and even though Six of Crows did do some interesting things just in general it's not the kind of story that I like as much as I like cool science fictions that explore interesting concepts and interesting moral dilemmas so definitely the original is going through to the next round. Then our next battle is Hunters of the Dusk by Darren Chan up against Queenslayer by Sebastian de Castell. So Queenslayer is the fourth book in the Spellslinger series. Is that right or is it the sixth book? Regardless it's the second to last book. This is a book about this boy named Kel who just as he was about to do his magic exam he discovered that he was losing his magical powers and he tried to figure out some way to like trick his way through his exams and what happened after that has led to him traveling around the world uh, and every single book basically takes him to a new location where there's a whole new cast of characters and a whole new magic system being introduced. This book was no different but he does end up getting involved with this very young queen who is said to have had the soul of the queens for the last 200 years or something uh, but basically it's this young girl trying to hold this kingdom together and Callan gets involved with all the politics and trying to help out but he's not always as helpful as he is hoping to be. As usual things go sideways things go very badly for him but these books are always very fast paced and really interesting as you try to figure out how things are gonna go wrong or at least that's what I always end up doing. I do enjoy the sense of humor that these books bring to some fairly dark topics. I will say this one was much darker than some of the earlier books in the series or at least it was darker than I was expecting. Some language and some things that happened that I just was like oh I thought that I had in the earlier books been thinking of these as young young YA but in these ones I think it may be targeted more at an older YA which makes sense it's a long running series and so the books kind of grow up with their audience. Anyway I did really enjoy this book and I am looking forward to reading the last book in the series and seeing how things wrap up for Kellen and if we're putting this up against the books in the Cirque du Freak series I would say that for me at least I do enjoy these Spellslingers books more but I mean they're much longer there's always a lot more to them so 
maybe not a fair comparison, but regardless, I'm going to put Queen Slayer through to the next round. And then for our last battle in this round, we have The Knee Bone Boy by Alan Potter, up against Percy Jackson and The Last Olympian. Does it have an S on the end of that title? I'm not sure, but Percy Jackson and The Last Olympians. So, Percy Jackson, this is the last book in the original Percy Jackson series, so the fifth book, and things are finally wrapped up with this whole prophecy about one of the children of the gods causing a bunch of problems. Uh, so, if you haven't heard about the Percy Jackson series, we're following Percy Jackson, who is the son of an Olympian god, and he goes to Camp Half-Blood, where all these other children of of the gods go during the summer to learn about their powers and about their family I guess. <laughs> And in each book, Percy goes on a different quest. The series does a really amazing job of bringing Greek mythology into a more modern world. And there's also usually some twists and turns and things get brought together in a very clever way. And this book was no different. I really love the way that the prophecy came into play. Any book where you have a prophecy right from the beginning, you kind of know that the prophecy is going to happen, but maybe not in the way that you thought it was going to happen. Uh, right, also in this last book, we're kind of introduced to the idea that one of our friends is a spy or betraying us and so trying to figure out which one of our friends was doing that was really interesting and I thought that was also done in a really interesting way. I've said the word interesting like a million times here but basically I do think these are really clever middle grade fantasies. They're a lot of fun as well, a good like quite a lot of humor introduced into the stories and again this is one that a lot of people read when they were younger and they really love it and have a lot of nostalgia for the series and I can totally 100% understand that. I had a lot of fun reading them. I would say because I'm not the target market, I wasn't like emotionally invested, but I am glad that I've read this series so that I have the context for what people are talking about with the Percy Jackson world. And I really wish that I'd been able to read this when I was younger because I loved Greek mythology when I was younger and I would have really loved it. But unfortunately, I was just a little bit too old to read these when I was young. Anyway, Putting this up against the Nebo Boy is kind of difficult because I would say that I maybe enjoyed my experience of reading the Nebo Boy more. Neither of these books are really targeted at me, but I just found the quirky writing style in the Nebo Boy a lot more fun. But at the same time, I think that the way the Greek mythology was incorporated into the Percy Jackson books was much more clever and I think a lot more people would enjoy the Percy Jackson books than the Kneebone Boy. And I do think this last book wrapped up the Percy Jackson series really well. And the prophecy stuff was really clever. So I think that I'm actually going to put Percy Jackson and the last Olympian through to the next round. So that means we are up to the semi-finals. In our first battle, we've got The Invisible Life of Eddie LaRue by V. Schwab up against the original by Brandon Sanderson and Mary Robinette Cowell. So... I feel like this is going to be one where I stare into space for a long time trying to make the decision. I know I said a lot more negative things about Eddie LaRue, however, I still do really enjoy my reading experience of it and I do think it had some really beautiful writing in it. And the concepts were interesting even if it didn't explore the exact aspects of it that I would have liked it to explore. I could also say for the original that's also kind of true because it was such a short novella some of that world that I would have liked to get more of didn't get explored because it just didn't make sense in the story to explore it. And I mean I guess for Addie LaRue you could say that too like the stuff that I wanted it to explore didn't make sense for the story it was trying to tell it didn't make sense to explore that stuff when it would throw out one paragraph about how she helped out in the war as a spy and she learned how to do all these different things as part of helping out in the war. I wanted so much more of that, but writing a lot more of that wouldn't have helped to progress the themes of the story and probably couldn't have been done with the same magical writing that was used for the story. <sighs> I just looked at my spreadsheet and I gave the original a much higher score. I gave it 4.1 and I only gave Eddie LaRue 3.4. But I feel like it's not that simple. Although at the same time, I'm like, am I just letting the hype of Eddie LaRue impact my decision? And that's the most frustrating thing about Eddie LaRue. Because there was so much hype, I went into it with quite high expectations. And it's always hard for really hyped books to live up to those kind of expectations. Although you could also say for the original, because I love Brandon Sanderson, 
I also went into that with pretty high expectations. Do you know what? I've spent so long trying to make this decision. My battery is about to die. So I'm going to go and make the decision and come back to you. Okay, I'm back. And I have decided that even though I think Addie LaRue was beautiful and I think a lot of people will really relate to it and love it and a lot of people have, uh, I, I just think for me I enjoyed the original much more and it's just the kind of story that I personally like a lot more. So I'm gonna put the original through to the finals but I will say that I think Addie LaRue probably belongs in second place for this month even though it's not gonna make it to the final. So anyway let's move on to the second battle of the semi-finals and that is between Queen Slayer by Sebastian de Castell and Percy Jackson and the Last Olympians by Rick Riordan. I really should look up whether it's Olympian Olympians and the Last Olympian. I'm really too lazy to look it up. Anyway, regardless, both these series were a lot of fun. Definitely Queen Slayer was a lot darker and I do like darker things. I would also say both of these are funny but I probably like the humor of the Spellslinger series better and I feel like it's so hard once you've gotten a certain way through a series like both of these are fifth or sixth books in series so it's hard to just compare the individual books rather than comparing the whole series with each other and it's also not fair because the Spellslinger series is definitely targeting an older market and I am an older person although still much older than the target market for either of these series. I will say though with the Spellslinger series because every book is kind of this whole new cast of characters, a whole new place, a whole new magic system, it does kind of ruin that continuity. So if I try really hard to keep these books as individuals rather than series, I actually think the Percy Jackson book was cleverer in the way that it pulled everything together at the end and the way that it dealt with the prophecy. So actually, even though I maybe enjoyed Queen Slayer slightly more for my own reasons, I think I think that Percy Jackson was a better book. So I'm going to put Percy Jackson and The Last Olympian through to the finals. And so that means our final is the original by Brandon Sanderson and Mary Robinette Crowell up against Percy Jackson and The Last Olympian. And I still don't know exactly what the title of that book is. But anyway, I feel like the final is going to be obvious here. Even though I really enjoyed Percy Jackson and I can see why people have so much nostalgia for that series, I personally love the original much more. I really hope we can get a written version of it rather than just the audio with all the annoying sound effects or an audio version without all the sound effects. Uh, but I know a lot of people can't actually consume audiobooks very well. They don't like to consume things in that way so it would be good to get a written version. I'm sure there's a plan to put out a written version. I also would really hope that maybe there's a plan to write some more stories in this world because I do think some of the concepts were really interesting and that Brandon Sanderson could think of some really cool things to do with it and Mary Robinette Cowell probably has some ideas of her own as well because I do also really love her Lady Astronaut series so um, I definitely respect both of them as writers and hopefully they'll work together more because the outcome was good. So that was all the books that I read in January. Do let me know if you have read any of these books or what you thought about them because I would love to talk with you more about them down in the comments. Otherwise thank you so much for watching. I hope that you are doing well and I will see you next time.